Hope Dog. Okay, here's what we got planned for you today. We're going to talk about the Martin 14, this beast behind me, five bladed beast. Why the Griffin engine? What were the challenges of putting uh, a Griffin engine on the Spitfire? What were some of the changes, either needed or desired, when they put a Griffin engine on the Spitfire? What were then some of the resulting operations at that aircraft, the Mark 14 in particular? What did they conduct operationally during the war? What were some of the successes of the airplane had? We're going to tip our hat to uh, September. September 15th is Battle of Britain Day. So we're going to take the month of September. We're just going to tip our hat a little bit to the 82nd anniversary of the Battle of Britain. And then Mike Hodson over here, he's going to talk you through the history of our CAF show now, Mark 14. And Rob Oberling in the back, he's one of our uh, maintenance gurus uh, that keep this thing in the air. He's going to talk about some thermodynamic uh, research, and development, and testing uh, that they did on this airplane just recently, just over the past few months. It's pretty fascinating. Then we're going to open up for Q and A. We hope that takes about an hour. So about noon time, uh, we're going to when we're done here. We're going to open up some of the cockpit, sorry, the cockpit, the hangar doors to get a little better light. And for those who want, go behind the left wing and look into the cockpit of our Mark 14. Then I've already kind of highlighted the other displays. Take your time. Go see uh, all our other airplanes, our artifacts back here. And maybe somewhere in the 12.30 to 1 o'clock range, we will have towed the Spitfire out. And assuming the weather still cooperates, Rob is going to do an engine run for us, which might be pretty cool. That is tentative, but we'll have to make sure that ramp space and operational and maintenance requirements and the weather all give us a thumbs up. And here's a sample. Maybe two, two and a half blades on the starter before the engine kicked in. Way to go, maintenance team. Way to go, maintenance. Okay, Spitfire Mark 14. Uh, amazing airplane. Note the bubble canopy. Not all Mark 14s had bubble canopy. They went for the full, they started with the full fuselage sliding former canopy, but then they went to the cut down fuselage and the bubble canopy, which started to um, many airplanes by the Mustang with this bubble canopy. Greatly improved visibility, but they, not all of them had. So why Griffin Power as opposed to the Merlin? So I'll admit to you, when I started my research into the uh, presentation today, it struck me, why would you want to replace the legendary Marlin engine with a different engine? Well, what I found out was the design of the Griffin started in 1938. So was the Marlin engine around there? Yes, it was. But had it engaged in combat operations at that time? No, it hadn't. So it hadn't yet met that legendary status. Look at the year that the Mustang came about, right? Remember the Mustang, the first models of the Mustang had the Allison engine on it. It's a fabulous engine, but it didn't have a supercharger to get up to the high altitudes that the European War was fought at, fought at in many times. So it wasn't until 43 that the British said, let's put a Merlin on the Mustang. So the Griffin was well before that. Okay, so not really. The Griffin didn't really replace the legendary Merlin. It came along in addition to the Merlin. 
Um, and I found it interesting that it, it, um, the Genesis was from the Royal Navy. So the fleet air arm in late 30s looked ahead and said, well, let's, just, let's get another engine design to handle some of our new aircraft designs that are starting to meet the drawing boards and maybe get into prototypes. And we need it capable of generating good power at low altitude. Well, talk about subjective. What is good power at low altitude? But that's what started. So Rolls Royce got busy and started designing the Griffin engine. I kind of mentioned uh, the British the British idea to put the Merlin on the bus. Well, the ingenuity of the British in the late 30s and throughout the war was just indescribable. All the great things, technology-wise, that the British came up with. So, again, it was a British Rolls-Royce engineer who said, let's put the Griffin designed for other things like this fairy firefly. That's going to get written yeah. on the Spitfire. And here we go. And now we're all here loving each other on this Saturday morning. Okay, the initial production variant, uh, the Griffin II, had a single stage two speed supercharger. Very similar to that Allison I talked about. Fabulous engine at lower altitudes, did not maintain the power in manifold pressure as altitude increased. And where were the Messerschmitts and the Falklands in the early 1940 and 41? 35, 38, 40,000 feet. And the single stage supercharger, even on this bigger engine, didn't, didn't uh, match up. You can see they started, so a Griffin II, an early design production version, had over 1,700 horsepower. I got an eye chart coming up here later that show the chronology of the horsepower gains from early Merlins to later Merlins to early Griffins to later Griffins, and it's eye-opening. The Griffin 6 was an advancement, and they added another 100 plus horsepower. That's a lot. That means a, that means a great deal, uh, even though it's, it might seem like a, a small number. So here's the Griffin 65. We talked about that those, that last bullet, the Griffin 3, the Griffin 6. Those were just a couple of the early Griffins. Then they went to the 60 series, which had a two-stage, two-speed supercharger and allowed the engine to maintain a higher manifold pressure as altitude increased. The Griffin 65 variant of that is what went into the Mark 14. It evolved from the Griffin 6. This, we're now up over 2,000 horsepower. The prototype, Spitfire, had 1,030 horsepower. And now in three years, we've doubled that. Sorry, the British have doubled that. A long production run, because they used the Griffin in some of the post-war long-range uh, reconnaissance airplane. You can see some of the numbers. It's a V-12. It's big, 2240 cubic inch. Put out a long way. Right? And it did eventually, 42, 43, it did replace the Merlin. And there was a larger improved Griffin that superseded the Merlin. There's your very first Spitfire airframe with the Griffin. It was a Mark IV. So we're not going to get into this conversation because not even Rob can talk about how did they number the marks, right? Not even Rob can do that. But they took a Mark IV, which was not in the Merlin series of marks, and they put the Griffin on it. There's the first, you can see the serial number, DP-845. First Spitfire with the Merlin. So what were some of the challenges of putting larger, heavier Griffin into the made for the Merlin Spitfire? Larger, heavier. Initially, they were having directional control. 
right nose control is so critical in a tail fight. It's so ultimately critical. And so they took that first airplane, the Mark IV, and then when they started moving towards production airplanes, they put the Griffin, the Mark VIII. The Mark VIII had a, what I'll call, a smaller vertical tail. As you can see, they found out very quickly what was the title of our brief? The Five-Bladed Beast. That little vertical tail couldn't properly provide direction of stability and control to the pilot with the increased power of the Griffin. So they could have bought a larger, as the British called it, fin, larger fin on it. Hey, the range, the Griffin was much thirstier than the Merlin, so it reduced the range. You can see a very clever, we'll talk about some of the operation. Well, air defense. Air defense means you're pretty much, you're defending something that's almost right below you. So you don't need that range. And initially, um, the Griffin, the Mark 14, didn't have the range to escort the bombers way into Germany. So they started with air defense. We'll get there. Pilot training. Only the British. They walk away. Only the British. So what do they start doing with the Griffin? The propeller turns the other way. So what do all of the Merlin bred Spitfire pilots used to? You add power from the pilot's seat, the blades turn clockwise. The torque of that takes the aircraft to the left. So as you're adding power, you're adding right rudder. Left hand, right rudder. The Griffin turns the other way. So now you're adding power and you have to break that muscle memory and add left rudder. So there's that habit and that muscle memory. Plus the immense torque of this thing, you had to open up that throttle slope. And what I hear from our Spitfire pilots is you can tell when you can, you've gone as far as you can with the throttle on takeoff because you no longer have enough left rudder to keep it from cutting the grass off the side of the runway. Okay, I gotta pull it back. Merlin race pipe. Here's some quotes from Merlin Red Spitfire. A hairy beast. I love this second. Even with full air on, full rudder, this thing takes off sideways. Right? And I talked about what is so critical on these tail draggers on initial takeoff until you start getting rudder authority, and especially on landing, nose control. Duck, you gotta go straight. And, okay, well, I'll just take off sideways because that's how much torque and power in this prison. So what were some of the needed or desired changes? Well, as you increase horsepower, what you want to do is you want to be able to harness that horsepower by putting bigger or more propeller blades so that you can bite more air, right? As you're adding power, you are increasing or decreasing, however you look at it, the the curvature of that, not the curvature, but the angle of the road, the propeller blade to bite more air because the propellers pull you through the air. And what they found with to, to properly harness all this new horsepower, they couldn't increase the blade length because of ground curves. We're going to ground strike. So they added a fifth blade. Now I can bite more air. I've got five blades grabbing all this air because my horsepower allows me to and, and harness that extra blade. They extended the fuselage. One of the earlier slides, the Griffin is heavier and larger. So they had to extend the fuselage. You'll see in this chart I have the wing 
the, the glory of the Spitfire is really the wing. And you'll see how going from the Mark I all the way to the Mark 24, the wingspan is exactly the same. They move the radios back, think back to 1939 technology. How big was a radio? Two-way radio back then. So they move those out. That kind of counters out. Larger radiators. I've got another photo coming up or an illustration. It had to increase the size of the radiators to cool this larger beast of an engine. And um, therefore the housing of the radiators obviously had to light. The E wing, they were able to do that, so the different the A, the B, and the earlier marks, the C, the D, and the E wing all kind of had to do with the armament inside of it. And another fascinating story, and a great aeronautical engineering. Now, it's all about trade offs. Well, the further you out the wing, you put weight, like machine guns or cannon, that may affect how it maneuvers. And it's all a trade off. So they decided on this Mark 14 with the E-Wing. The E-Wing kind of got rid of the outer machine guns, the 303s that the earlier Mark started with, and kind of stabilized on two 20 millimeter cannons and two 50 caliber machine guns. There's a good illustration. So we read left to right. So look at the bullets up here. Come take a look. We don't, don't grab it and walk away with it. 303, 50 cal, 20 millimeter. And the bullet can, which I kind of uh, talked about. So that wasn't a needed, but very much a desire change to this aircraft and many of the other aircraft uh, of all the Allies. And there's your first production Britain powered Spitfire. It was the Mark 12. Had a Griffin 4 in it, so that had a single stage Griffin. So that would have, that would have been a monstrous lower altitude performer, but less so higher altitude. So what were some of their operations and successes? Well, the Mark 14s were the first production variant of the Spitfire that had the Griffin 65. We talked about two stage, two speed maintains the power, the manifold pressure of an altitude. Okay, the first in the service was 610th Squadron, late 1943. Okay, it was a substantial increase in performance over the Mark 9. So why did I compare it to the Mark 9? Well, as they advanced uh, through the Marks, the Mark 1s and the Mark 2s fought the Battle of Britain, the Mark V shortly followed. Well, what's, what are the Germans doing? They're introducing the Falk Wolf 190. And the Mark V couldn't perform with the 190. So the Mark IX was to stop at measure. Boy, tomorrow we need a better Spitfire to, to, to fight this 190. And the Mark IX was that plug the gap with the added benefit that the Mark 9 turned out to be a phenomenal airplane. So that's why at one of the premier Merlin power must, uh, sorry, Spitfire was Mark 9. So that's why we compare to Mark 14. The, fir the first with the Griffin 65 with the Mark 9. And it was a substantial performance increase and it could match or outmatch the Falk 0490 all the way up to the 40s, low 40s, where the Falk most like to live. At least that's where they started. It excelled in air, air defense. Our Mark 14 was great. As long as I didn't have to fly back to Tom, I could just fight over Ricky. I was good. Plenty of gas to get to my spot and fight. Okay, it was also well suited, as you'll see a photo coming up, this, the V1 flying buzz bomb, he could intercept it and stay with it and tip it. 
Very interesting. I found this sidebar. Let's go back to the Royal Navy's specification. They wanted good power at low altitude. Well, by the time after D-Day, where all of a sudden we're putting Allied air bases on the continent, all right, let's bring some Mark 14s over there. It ended up being the premier high altitude air superiority fighter. Okay, there's, there's the first squadron, 610 squadron in formation, Southeast England doing the air defense. If I can take off and I can orbit over quick, so that only takes me five minutes to get to my combat air patrol location, and I can orbit there for a long time and still have plenty of gas when the enemy shows up. Here's a photo of the left of that tipping, amazing photo. And the Mark 14 excelled at that. I think I have tipped, if you will, or shot down 300-ish buzz bombs, which means those inaccurate buzz bombs didn't even come close to their intended target. Lands out the farmer's field much better than landing somewhere in London. And the Mark 14 excelled at that. Yes, an eye chart. So here's uh, some pointers. Talk about the wing. So look at the wingspan, 3610. Yep, that would, but that's the LF. So they clip the wings on aircraft. They said it's only going to fly low altitude. So let's take some of that wing off. We don't need it in the higher density air at low altitude. Same kind of thing with the HF, high altitude. They had to increase the wingspan to get more lift in the thin air up and out to But other than those two, 3610 all the way across. So let's take at the length. The earlier marks, the moment, they're all pretty consistent. But look what we had to do to Mark 14. We had to lengthen that fuselage. And here is just remarkable. So here's the first production with an early Merlin producing a little over a thousand. By the time we get down here, we have more than double in the span of about four to five years. That's amazing. Uh, you know, so also I wanted to talk about the armament. So what the, what the British found, especially during the, the Battle of Britain, was boy, I may have been peppering that Messerschmitt with 303s and maybe it smoked, but it was able to fly back across the channel, land, get patched up, and fight the next day or two. The 303s just didn't have the knocking power. And come take a look at these and you'll see why. So they moved to, here's the heat wing again on Mark 14, it's in yellow. 220 millimeters, 250 pounds. Great illustration. On the bottom is the Mark 1 with a Merlin. On the top is the Mark 14 with the Griffin. And that's one, that's one illustration. I didn't have to copy and paste and line up this thing. So a great illustration of how the Griffin extended the fuselage and made it um, such a longer airplane than that initial Mark I. Some factoids. You know, less than a thousand of the Mark 14s built. That's not a lot. In the production numbers of the day, that's not a lot. It was able to reach 400 miles an hour. That's fast. That is fast. And that's in level flight. And it was the first Allied aircraft to shoot down the 262, a jet. There's our cockpit, fairly smart one. There's not enough, there's not a lot of wind in the cockpit. The control column right here does not move laterally. The control column does not move laterally. The spade does. Now the control column does move for and aft for the elevator, right? Big trees, little trees. But it doesn't move this way. Primarily because there's no room. Secondarily, the pilot's legs get the way. 
pretty spartan. And as most of the fighters of the day, it wasn't about the cockpit. It was about the guns and the engine. Bear with me. Let's take a look. Very short clip of our Mark 14 airborne flying off one of our other airborne. Five-bladed beast. So I do want to tip our hat, tip my hat, tip our hat to the 82nd anniversary of the Battle of Brandon. That is a, a picture of, we talked about high altitude. So when you look at airliners today and you see an airliner con, what does that immediately tell you? It's high altitude. So here are Spitfires and measurements at high altitude. So that two-stage, two-speed supercharger had to be in it, and the Merlin got there to get up there and be able to fight them and not just fall out of the sky. So generally considered by Anglo-American historians as the 10th of July to the 31st of October of 1940, Right in early September, uh, the uh, perhaps very uh, beneficial to the Allies, Germans decided, hey, we're going to more focus on bombing money in early September. So the blitz that we probably all heard about, big picture, the result enforced the cancellation of the German invasion of the uh, English Isles because the Germans had said, we have to have air superiority to do it. And the RA had to prevent it. So it canceled that invasion. That was critical. And it was also the birth, thanks to British ingenuity, and chiefly Sir uh, Field Marshal Sir um, Hugh Dowling, who organized, he was Chief of Fighter Command, he developed what ended up being the modern air defense system. Integrated airplanes, radars, visual observers, controllers. And that started right there. Got a Mark I. Look at the Mark I down here. Okay, I think that's enough of me. What we're going to do now, we're going to hand it over to Mike Hodson, and he's going to talk about. Welcome everybody, thank you. Um, to say I have a tough act to follow behind Rob is an understatement, so I'm going to do what I can do and bear with me. And uh, this is my second time, so we're kind of trying to, trying to get better at this. So we have a picture of our airplane there, sitting there in India, and we'll get to that. But that's a period picture, that's what it looked like back in the day. So we'll talk a little bit about the history of the November Hotel 749, which is the serial number of our airplane, uh, built in Aldermaston Factory in Berkshire, England. Uh, a lot of the Spitfires that were made were made in Castle Bromwich Factory. The Aldermaston Factory was a satellite factory. Uh, our airplane was delivered to the RAF in 1945. It got to the fight too late, did not fight in Europe. It was shipped to India, July 2nd, 1945, went to Karachi via the SS Fama Turney. I love the ship name, it's just wonderful. We never had that ship of ours. So it was likely that our Spitfire was never flown by the RAF. It went from the factory, got shipped to India, went into the Indian Air Force. So uh, sold to the Indian Air Force December 29, 1947. It was assigned to T3 IAF. What does that mean? That means a training squadron number three of the Indian Air Force. So it was used as an instructional aircraft. They were teaching pilots how to fly, 
high performance airplanes with our spin power. So in the late 1970s, the airplane hadn't flown for many years. It was uh, a derelict, to put it mildly. It was at Patna Air Base in India. Patna shown on the map where the red dot is, that is Patna in Air Base in India. You can see the airplane is sitting there, a couple of 55 gallon drums, pretty looking pretty derelict. It was recovered and shipped to Duxford for re restoration. Has anybody ever been to Duxford that's here? Okay. So if you're a Warburg fan and you're in England and you're anywhere near London, make sure you go to Duxford. It's a haven for Warburgs. The, the big uh, point of interest is there are two Duxford, two Duxfords in England. I went to England many years ago, went to the train station. I said I'd like to buy a ticket to Duxford. They sold me a ticket. They were very nice. I got off the train in Duxford. I looked around and I said, um, okay. So I went to the local conductor and I said, uh, okay, where's the air museum? And he kind of chuckled and said, thought to himself, I'm sure that crazy Yank doesn't know what he's doing, which was true. So he said, well, you, you're at the wrong Duxford. Oh, okay. So I got back on the train, went back to London, went to Duxford, and got a very nice time. So it's the right Duxford is critical if you want to visit some airplanes. The other Duxford is very lovely and very pretty, but they don't have Anyway, there's the airplane sitting there getting ready to be shipped on crates and pallets and things, looking uh, pretty tired. So, Cranfield is a city in England. That's where the airplane was restored. Uh, the map again shows Cranfield there, the white in the bottom of the map, that's London, so it's northwest of London. You can see the airplane going together piece by piece going into flying condition, so as usual, these processes take a long time. So it flew in 1983, 1985, our good friend David Price, Santa Monica Museum of Flying, bought the airplane, brought it over to California and put it into the Santa Monica Museum of Flying. They did not fly, they don't fly their airplanes at Santa Monica, they just have them on display. They have a Spitfire and have uh, what is now R0, but at the same time, the museum is still quite 2005, David decided to downsize the collection at the Santa Monica Museum. He thought, well, CAF would be a good place for a couple of premier warbirds. So he sold us the Spitfire and the Zero. He came here in 2005 and been here ever since. So we were fortunate. We had, we had as we do now, a number of volunteers. We found out that one of our volunteers was a former laureate mechanic worked on Spitfires and in the airplane. We enlisted him, he drove the project, and we got the airplane from the Santa Monica Museum, which was in good shape, but it wasn't in flying shape, so he got it in the flying shape for us. We had every detail was inspected and did a thorough inspection and flew it for about 15 years between 2005 and a couple years ago when we started working on the airplane. So, We'll see some pictures of the airplane in the air here in a minute. Um, we're now, like at this current moment, um, our Spitfire crew has been working hard seven days a week to try to get the airplane ready. Um, we're on the home stretch of an extensive annual inspection, restoration, not really restoration, but inspection, upgrading the systems. One of the critical things on the airplane is a rather prone to overheating on the ground. Obviously, operate in Southern California, where it's quite a bit warmer than it is in England, presents its challenges. So we're actually putting it in, we have put in a spray bar system in the airplane that sprays coolant on the leading edge of the radiator to try to mitigate the overheating problems on the ground. So the taxi for the more than a couple of three minutes without the airplane overheating. So that's that's what we're doing now. We're getting up to the final stage. We've run the airplane a couple of times. We're going to probably run it today for you, depending on the weather, and we'll see what it sounds like. So these are a few pictures of the airplane in action. We had in 2016, we had a uh, seminar here, photography, air to air photography seminar. Our Spitfire was flying at the time. We had some professional photographers in here. So a few pictures of the airplane when it was flying. This particular picture is my favorite of the group. Um, I love the texture and background of the mountains striking against the 
aircraft in the sky, and you would think that was a photoshopped picture. It's not. That guy just did a wonderful job with the picture, so that's a good one. Another one, airplane in the air, you can get a good idea of the plan for the airplane and see it, and all the canopy and detail, and get 500 gallon in the air, et cetera, et cetera. Just a wonderful, wonderful photograph. And another one, over in the mountains, just north of here, back away from the camera, you can get a good idea of the markings. Striking in this photograph are the radiators shaking down under the wings, big part of the uh, Griffin conversion that we're all talking about. And then down low, going fast, beautiful over the runway. Just the image of speed, the image of the Spitfire, it's just doing what it did best, which was fly, fly fast, do its job. So, great picture. So, Spitfire and Thermodynamics are next. You have the pleasure of Rob Moberly as your thermodynamic expert. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. They left the guy with the funny accent to the end. So, I asked if we need an interpreter. We're doing it without an interpreter, so just better with me as much as you can. Um, talking about thermodynamics, but we'll probably get into some other stuff as well. Rob talked about the Queen and the Spitfire. The third on that line is the E Type Jaguar. All icons of England. No question about it. Think about the Queen, Spitfire, and the E Type. I don't know which one I prefer out of the three. I have to say, I was very sad to see the Queen pass. Uh, great to see this thing flying, great to see E-types on the road. This photo, um, the pilot there is Steve Barber, who was our wing leader for a while past the way. So, you miss him, he was um, the main pilot on the spit from the time he flew. Um, and a few things to go through on that. Ross referred a couple of times to the Spitfire crew. I'd like to actually call them out. The first is Ned Grabowski, who is our Spitfire um, king, and um, was absolutely instrumental in designing and fitting the systems that we were talking about. Rob Seeger in the back, and Alan from Taylor, who on the board. They have been working non stop on this aircraft to get it back into flight. Now, a couple of things to note on this. Look at the size of those radiators. Use an English expression, they are mighty big radiators. They really are very, very large. They're Mark 1, right way through to the Mark 9. The Mark 9 started putting symmetrical radiators on. The Mark 1 only had one coolant radiator on one side. The Mark 9 had two radiators on both sides, but they were teeny in comparison to these things. It's because of the size of that engine. It's a monster engine. It generates an enormous amount of heat. And you've got to lose that heat or something else. So you run it out to the radiators, put it into the problem the system, and transfer that out to the radiators as fast as you can. The other thing you'll notice on the back of those radiators is the little radiator doors are open. That's very unusual to see that in flight. The work we've done over the last few years, those doors hardly ever open in flight. Because in flight, the aircraft runs at a really steady 100 degrees centigrade on the pool. Remember that one. 100 degrees. You don't want to get up to 110, you don't want to get up to 120 because the engine will start to cook at that level. The doors open at 115, so the thing probably wasn't running absolutely right at this point when that picture was taken, but she's really hairy, so she's running. To understand what's happening on the aircraft, we started using thermal engine. It used to be pretty difficult to get the thermal imaging camera, expensive, big, on the things. Now, I think about this big, the clip's on the bottom of my iPhone, and it turns my iPhone into a thermal imaging camera. You can see the icon in the center, whatever you point that at, it will give you the temperature reading at that point. So the block of the engine there is 74.1, we're going to be working in centigrade, sorry about that. It's the only way I can do it. 74.1 centigrade. So you can see the massive difference between the temperature of the block of 74.1 and the exhaust for the running at 100 degrees centigrade. The exhaust is really thumping a lot. Of interest is the fact that the cam covers up on top of it, where we advertise Rolls Royce, those cam covers look really dark and you'd think they're cold, 
they're not, they're just really shiny and polished. And because they're shiny and polished, the infrared doesn't pick them up on the thermal energy, so they look dark. So when you see really dark, it's not that the thing's cold, it's just that it's probably a shiny surface. But that gives you a good picture of the front of the aircraft with the props running, the engines running, and the cowlings are off at this point, because my master's quick it does with their clothes on. Um, the next one is a close-up from the back behind, looking into the engine bay, and that very brightly coloured thing is the header tank for the cooling system. So as the engine gets hot, it's got coolant circulating all the way through it, and that coolant is pumped through into the header tank, and then down from the header tank, massive tube about that, that size, down to the radiators and the wings. And then the radiators and wings cool it, and the coolant comes back up to the engine through a large pump at the bottom, I believe, the uh, side of the engine. Just gives you an idea. It's 70-30 Just like, oh, yeah, 70% 70 water, 30% glycol. Um, the war they used to run more like 1820, 70-30s didn't work quite well in the course. Because in 105, maybe 110, something like that, it started to really go to the bush run. It's got a pop-off valve on it's a good question, but it's, it's got a pop-off valve on the header tank which blows at 110, I believe. And that point you really get a head of steam on the head tank. Systems pressurized to about 30 psi when it's really done. So these are the radiators, you know, they don't have a cow in so they don't look half as pretty as they do in the bath now. The two great boxes hanging down underneath. They're in the bed area, in the wings, they're recessed in the wings, and then the cowling forms around them. And in flight, the air is rammed in through those cowlings, in through the recesses in the wings, and out the back. So we've got really good air flow in flight. On the ground, you can see what's sitting right in front of it, the undercarriage. Just as it is there, the undercarriage falls right in front of the radiator, so immediately you've got the blocking. Any only on the ground. You've got flaps down in the back. Flaps are great big bar that the foot's going to move from them. They're really close to the back. Um, and the cooling airflow, even though you've got this massive great five-bladed prop rolling around like a fan in the front, never, Rob will tell you, you get very little airflow down the bottom around the radiators. If you're standing by the radiators, you hardly feel any airflow. If you move three feet now, you almost blow them run. Immediately it starts to kick the side. Um, so it's great in flight, it's a problem on the ring. If you've got a hundred and hundred and ten out on the ramp, and the tower's holding you there, waiting for someone coming in over van eyes on the final, um, it's a slow process and the thing will overheat very fast. So we had to do something about that quickly. Um, the first thing we did was run it without any modifications at all, and got her up to about 95 degrees. So the coolant's running 95 degrees Celsius at this point. And that left-hand radiator showing 55.5 on the front of the radiator. That's what it runs around about 95 to 100. Left radiator has got coolant in the front, oil in the back, tandem radiator. And I'm asking why? That's the way it was built. The right hand side has got the intercool radiator in the front and then the cooling radiator in the back. Tandem, not side by side. Just an interesting way to write down. So at that rate, she's running about 55 degrees. This is the back of that same radiator. This is the oil cooler running 50.9. The oil at that point should be probably about 70 to 80 degrees in the dial. The right hand on the radiator, which I can 25.4 and uh, no at all. The reason for that is that's the one from the integral. Rob talked about the two-stage, two-speed supercharger. The way we fly the plane, particularly on the ground, it's not getting hot. That supercharger is just not working. You're not getting to the second stage. The second stage on our aircraft's been deactivated because it kicks in at 15,000 feet. We don't have 15,000 feet. 
Um, so it's just not requiring any cooling at all through that front one. And then the back one on the right hand side is really hot again, about the same as the front left, because this is the coolant in the back side of the right hand radiator. So we've got it up to this temperature, kind of running the race, coming along well. And Trace, our maintenance officer at that point, you can just, uh, let's see if I can look this way. You can, that's his head, that's his arm, and that's the foot. He's holding his spray in front of the radiator on the end of the about 1,200 revs. He's the one all the way around, and he's spraying water on the front of the radiator. And if you can read that temperature there, it's actually 31 degrees. So just by holding a manual spray in front of that radiator, you dropped about 20 odd degrees centigrade on the radiator itself. Didn't have any effect in the cockpit, couldn't see any of the temperatures go down, but the way it made so cold, so the pedals didn't work. Ned then designed and built the cooling systems, which are tanks in the front of the wings, where she used to have fuel tanks, never had fuel tanks, since it was restored. And in the gun bays, we installed pumps, filters, regulators, and everything to drive the spray bars underneath. And when you get a chance, if you look right up inside the radiators underneath, you see the spray bars up at the top. So, put them all on, put the spray bars in, ran them, spray pan them up. This again, about 95 to maybe 100 on this run. Radiators running 57.2, a little higher than 55 in your run. Then, we turn the sprays on, drop to the third two. Very, very Quite, quite impressive. Again, not much effect in the cockpit. It seems to slow the increase in the cockpit. It doesn't stop it, it doesn't cool it down, but it seems to slow it down. We think we've got about 45 minutes worth of water in the tanks, so we should have more than enough to keep the engine cool for run up and taxi back when they get us most exposed to overheating. Taxi back seems to be the worst. You can do whatever you're going to be doing with the aircraft. Try and pre cool the doors open, get it down on the ground, and then you're taxiing back with the wind behind you. So, none of them is working at all. You might need to still have flaps on them for some of the point, and the things will be put really quite quickly. So, that's it on what we've done with spray bars and everything. That seems to have been a success. We said we're coming out of um, annual and um, getting her ready to go. That work happening on the brakes just now. Um, but that's it. Rob was going to take my over with Martin Q&A. Outstanding, Rob. Outstanding. So, you know, a numbers guy, when you showed uh, low 50s on the town, Celsius, and then you spray it with water, it was in the low 30s. That's approaching a 50% decrease in temperature. Okay, what we're going to do, maybe, is where might Bailey go? We're going to open it up. Any questions? Check, check. We're going to ask for your patience. We're going to hand the microphone around. Where is Mike Hudson? Mike Hudson here. In case you have a so any questions, we kind of talked about the mark, we talked about mark 14, we talked about our airplane, we talked about the dynamics. So based on your question, we'll get the right guy up here to answer it. So here we go. First question, Bill. An age-old question. Um, P47, all that, airport engines used to be able to land back on carrying half the engine shot. Spitfires, Mustangs, Hurricanes, one well priced 303 bullet that will take that aircraft in. If you hit the tank, you hit anything in the coolant system, that aircraft's done. You have to land. Um, I'm not sure in combat, there's an, I'm sure people will argue completely, I'm not sure there's an advantage that you can completely pull the engine over the airport engine. 
what I will tell you is I think the plane looks so much prettier because it's got liquid for the engine. It sounds much better than the radio level of it. And it's built water with it. So there's no other way to it. From Larry in his last. Yeah, I, I, um, from the perspective of combat damage, I think what you'll hear or read about for both, I'll use the two main liquid tools, the Spitfire and the Mustang. They were pretty rugged in an air to air. So you get a Falkholf or a Messerschmitt behind the Spitfire, and the bullets are coming this way. And they proved pretty rugged as long as you did hit the pilot. But now let's transition to we're on the continent after D Day, and a lot of these aircraft went air to ground and they were strafing. And so now where did the predominance of the bullets come from? The ground. And it exposed the tender underbelly where a lot of this piping is for the coolants. And you get one bullet into the coolant line, even though it's this big, and all that coolant bleeds out, and pretty damn soon, or soon you're a glider. Okay, question. Oh, yes, sir. If replacing the engine was to improve the performance, why not just do contra rotate the balance? Oh, boy, that's a great engineering question. It's a really good question. Um, this engine, the Griffin, was fitted on the Shackleton with contra rotating propellers. It was also fitted in the Seafire Mark 47. That's a, a marine version of the Spitfire. It's the last marine version of the Spitfire built. Um, and it had a Griffin 75 or something, producing about 2,500 horsepower. Um, by 150 octane fuel with a contra rotating prop. The great thing about the contra rotating prop is you can jam this prop set all the power in and the thing will stay in a straight line. These props are operating in the opposite direction, so you don't have any of this tendency to cut the grass off to the right hand side, just run off the side of the aircraft carrier. Um, so it's particularly applied in there. They have had a couple of Mark 19 Spitfires with the Griffin engine run with contra-rotating props and they fly quite well. Most people take them off and put a single flight blade on because it's a, it's a purist thing. It looks better with a flight blade. The contra-rotating props have a great big prop uh, loss on it and it looks a bit clunky. Um, but the plane flew better with the contra-rotating prop. There's one right here. That was a great question, by the way. How did the uh, Indians deal with the heating issues? Or were they in a, a temperature a temperature zone, or did they have the same problem? I'll, throw, I'll let him answer, but I'll answer from the perspective of, of flying these airplanes today in the general aviation environment, where certainly in our case, you've got a tower. You can't just light the fire here on the ramp and point it into the wind and go. So the, the Brits over in England, you know, they had a, a mile square fog and you put the nose in the wind and you go in any direction and they're on the ground for two minutes. We may be on the ground for 20 minutes waiting for tower to say you're clear for takeoff. Let me add, see if you have anything else. It's exactly that. The temperatures are very, very similar. Uh, but I'm, uh, the uh, Southeast Asia in general, when this was flown, 100, 110 degrees with very high humidity, so the same temperature build up. It's literally a question of how fast can you get the aircraft in the air. At Duxford, where they operate some of these, they've got the green up in the tower, but these Griffin ones get out there and get in the air straight away. Merlin's overheat, you don't seem to overheat quite as fast as the Griffins do. The Griffins have got to get them up, and as soon as they're at about 150 knots, with the rate of head it goes up, it goes away. It's cool, it's fine, beautifully, it's just on the moment. So the trick is to get them on as fast as you can.
Um, the question was, have they added any spray bars anywhere else? This is the only Griffin that has spray bars on it at this point. Um, I don't know whether we're going to set a trend with it, but I don't know whether other people will take it up. Most other places have made adjustments to the way they fly to be able to do it, to be able to fly without the spray bars. A lot of them are not in urban spitfires, have had spray bars fitted. And you'll see that they're just on maybe one side, maybe both sides. Um, we're using a single pump application. We wanted two pumps for this one, just to get more spray in there. Um, but I think we'll see more Griffins adopting the same thing. And maybe Ned will become famous worldwide for having invented it. God help us if he does. <laughs> Rob, well, wait a minute. Are you R3? Or four. Rob, three or four? I'm not, it's all by age. It's all by age. That's your question. I rob one. In the, uh, in the infamous words of a uh, famous movie, can you teach monkeys to fly these airplanes? Uh, look at me. Yes. Yes. You know? I'll. I'll I'll spin your question to a major difference, not, not so much in the European war, but very, very much in the Pacific war. When you talk about pilots, pilots of the Allied side and pilots on the Axis side, the Japanese. And as the war progressed, training. Allies, especially the Americans, have had what, in hindsight, was a phenomenal training program. And that was thought through. Okay. So, yeah, you can, you can train people how to fly the simple. You know, we, we don't take. Where's Nobby? Nobby just got his pilot's license. We're not going to be able to. Yeah. Nobby has a little work to do before uh, our leadership puts him in the Spitfire. Okay. Um, I think we're doing okay on time. Yep. Let's take two more. Here. Um, what did they do on the Brinkman family about Oh, we got to listen to him. It's right. Here's here's the expert. It's one of my favorite subjects. This one, one of my favorites. Um, one on Spitfire against the 109 in combat. The only 109 can do a negative dive. I said like that top gun negative G dive. Um, Spitfire tries to do it. It's a ME109 is injected, bang and bang's injection. The uh, Spitfire is carburetted, bloody great carbon on it. And as soon as you nose over, the fuel flow comes out to the engine. That's not so bad, but when it restarts, you get tons of blank smoke, and everyone can see you from miles away. Look, here I am, come shoot me. Um, very, very ineffective. So, at the time, there was this wonderful woman called Gertrude Schilling. She used to race Nautilus, circle racing Nautilus, and um, she developed this little disc that you fit in the carburetor, and the disc has a hole that runs in the middle of it, which is called an orifice. And this orifice sits in the bottom of the car, and if you nose over in Mark 1, you don't get, if you've got that fitted, you don't get the cut out. And it became known as Mr. Chilling's orifice, so it was about that. This one has a, an updraft pressure pump. It's a Stromberg, greatly famous if you ever get one beneath the thing. Uh, three barrels, and because it's pressure fed, it just doesn't suffer from those problems at all. That it has, it is not an injection carb. It forces all the gas still into the throat of the carb, but it um, operates very much like an injection system in that it's pumped in very, very hard. You don't have any negative effects, but it would be good to Great question. Okay, let's take one more. Ron, hold, hold, hold on, please. Who 
when we're thanking people by the way, we're really happy to remember both Bennings, who uh, we couldn't call him when we can't be out of the room, so he's bitter. He's bitter. So bless him, Paul and Bennings, and the guys that we are in the community to start the working on the Okay, outstanding. I have a couple of comments to make to the comments I've had by thinking his son um, Ned King's telling me that he's wonderful, wonderful people. His son is still alive, I believe. Okay. Um, yeah, we had fitters, armourers, and riggers. Riggers handled the airframe, fitters handled the engine, and the armourers handled the weapon systems, as far as I remember. Does that, does that sound right? Okay, thank you all uh, in the interest of time and get moving and uh, hopefully seeing an engine ride. Just a few more slides. Thank you. Great questions. Really great questions. Um, so we're going to wrap it up here. A couple of things. I'd like to uh, yell and press the last seed of uh, information. Uh, in uh, early November, early to mid-November, we're going to talk about mass production and how did uh, not just America but the, um, the British and the Soviets as well will outproduce the action. So November 12th, uh, please come back. See if you can put it on your calendar, come back and join us. And we are working, we're in the final stages of getting the R 2023 uh, game plan together for the presentations we'll put there. So call, click, follow us on social media for the latest updates. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for joining us. Hang around, see all our stuff. Hang around for an engine Thank you.